All right, let me know when we're rolling, baby. Okay, let me know. Just say action. Just say action. Okay, I'll say action when we are rolling. And just to be clear, the time that I said action in that sentence and the previous sentence are not me saying action. Fuck, I did say it a third time. I guess we're rolling. Cut. <laughs> You're always Cut. using the, the beer koozie. I'm impressed by your consistency. I've only got one. I I, I guess for me, it's more... I don't drink much beer out of cans, I guess. Maybe it's just over here versus there. It seems like they come more in bottles here. Mm. But it does feel like uh, mid-90s summer barbecue kind of vibes. Like, I just don't mm. see... I don't see a koozie that much. Mm. Yeah, cans are big here, man. Is that, a, is that just a Melbourne thing? Is it a hipster thing? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's kind of more progressive. I think it's more environmentally friendly. Oh, gosh. I uh, wish I was woke to the beer um, standards you guys, these days. You guys will get there. You guys will get there. I just think it's just going to take a bit of time. But you have to agree with me here. Uh, if you bought the exact same brand of beer, same, same model, uh, in a can or in a bottle... They do taste different. Yes, cans way better. You think? Yes. Why is that? What do you like about a can? I don't know. I can't just. Dis- I can't. Well, you said it I tastes can't... better. <laughs> I, but I. What, what you said? Why? Why yeah, is what, the sky? Yeah, but blue, like, what? Dude? What? What qualities of the palate are you feeling? You know, more of in a can form. Um, freshness. You think it's fresher in a can? Yes, yes. Actually, I do think it's fresh, fresher. Um, let, and let me explain. Um, I I think with bottles, they tend to have a, they tend to get a bit warm. That kind of that last kind of couple of sips, a bit warm, a bit f- uh, flat. Oh, you're thinking the experience as drinking it. That by the yeah, end sorry, of I it, was thinking about the experience of drinking it. Yeah, no, sorry, I was, that, I, was, I was I thinking, wrong? no, I was expecting you to say like first sip of each, right? Like if you if I was to like Pepsi test you, no dog pun in, intended, and pour <laughs> like a shot's worth of beer bottle and a shot's worth of beer can, do you think you could tell them apart? Yeah, no, nah, no, yeah. Okay, you said both of the you said both of the words. You said yeah and nah. So so normally I'm right. you know as a fellow Australian I'm able to keep up with which of our yeah nahs means what, but in that one specific instance that was really ambiguous. Yeah, yeah it was. Can I, you can you do you think you could actually tell them apart? Probably not really. I don't. I, I can't tell anything. I don't know. You can't think- tell anything. <laughs> These are just stories that I tell myself, you know. Okay. Uh, I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> Welcome to Deep Ford, everybody. This is a podcast in which we try and inform the world about, you know, the state of life and the scientific, you know, discoveries that are being made, you know, the depths of discussion about politics. But as we've just discovered, Michael doesn't know anything about anything. So that might undercut some of our <laughs> sort of usefulness as a resource. So just take that on board. Oh, he's sitting through the internet with me, my friend Michael. Hello. Hey, big fella. My name's Nick. Hello. Hi. Hey, how are we doing? Oh, what's news? What's, 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 news? news? what's, what's news? news? What's news, Chief? What's news, Chief? Hey, King. You remember that when we were going to go to Hey, King for a while? I uh, never stopped. Okay. But we were both doing it. Okay, cool. Um, what's new on my end? I got, I got you know, Christchurch is... Is hip and happening at the moment. Ooh. I got a couple of got a couple of names to throw past you here. So, in big international visitors making their way to Christchurch, like tall or fat, all of them, all of the above. So, in sp- speaking of tall people, Conan O'Brien was in Christchurch a couple of weeks ago. C-O-B. He was he was he was over here filming season two of his travel show. God, the the town was a buzz. I bet. Um, or actually, cut that. You you Just don't bet. Cut, cut that. Cut me thinking. <laughs> like the audio of me thinking. To. Okay, cut sure. It. And shall we clarify why? No. So, so just to be clear, what I'm leaving in the I bet, but I'm deleting the pause afterwards. Yeah. 
Please. Okay, because it was because it was conspicuous. It's not. It's not good. I don't think that it was until you drew attention to it. I could have made it. I might have made it worse. Okay. All right. Action. <laughs> okay. We've started the podcast now. Uh, Conan O'Brien was here in town. Uh, KC's colleague shook his hand just around the corner in the in the wow. in the center of town. I, I'm yeah. gonna you know one up you here. Give me a little bit of um, your context so here for a second. Conan O'Brien, where's your where's your fan level at? Probably not yours, but I like him. I enjoy him. I listen to the pod every now and then. I like the pod if there's a good guest. Yep. I like his vibe. I'm not a super fan, but I like his vibe. But what do you think he's like as a person? Like, do you reckon he's like a, a good dude or do you reckon he's like Hollywoody? Like, do you think that you could have a conversation with him? Yeah. I think he, I reckon, this is what I think. I think he's a silly goof, uh, a silly goose. No, Ooh. no pun intended for <laughs> For you, Nicholas. Yes. Um, Dog uh, daddy is but already. But I, re- I reckon he could he could have a mean streak. Oh, interesting. You think there's a dark underbelly? I've, I've There's been hints at it, like, even it, through his own content, like the behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah. Where I reckon if it's, like, in the, right, in the writer's room at a particular hour of the night, I reckon he could probably... Because, I don't, I don't see a, a mean streak, but I can see people getting annoyed with him because he, like won't drop a bit or something like that, or he finds it funny to keep doing a thing over and over again, which is sort of our floor as well. Mm. But, but by most accounts, uh, well-regarded, well-liked, yeah. um, you know, comedy icon for, for good reason. Um, but as he talks about on the pod, like he has a sickness where he will keep talking to people that come up to him on the street well beyond what is like a polite interaction. Like he genuinely seems to like people. Yeah. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a story here. And I feel safe in being able to tell this because the chance that it, uh, the people involved in the story listen to this is practically zero. Oh, it's juicy. Okay. So uh, Conan O'Brien came to Christchurch. He was filming some stuff in town. He was heading out to the West Coast to do, you know, the, the premise of the, the travel show is that when he does Conan O'Brien needs a friend it uh, needs a fan the off you know the, the second part in the week where he just speaks to a fan not a celebrity um okay. he will sometimes just turn up at their door and just like <laughs> rock up there and be like hey you know how we said oh like we should hang out sometime here i am in your neighborhood unannounced on the other side of the world let's go do something yeah um and so he was going to uh, the West Coast to do exactly that to a fan who'd called up on the pod. So, uh, a friend of mine um, that I used to work with um, was a uh, big Conan O'Brien fan, big The Simpsons guy. And as it happened, uh, one of the people in his entourage he knew and she was staying with him on this trip when she came to Christchurch and right. it, he had, you know, bigged up how much he, you know, liked Conan and she had heard that and she'd passed it on to him. And so one day so just this, gets a this random is a friend... text. So uh, a friend of mine, a former colleague who used to work with, okay. Yes. Yeah, who I used to work with had one of Conan's team staying with him when she was in Christchurch. Yep. So she passed on, Oh, Hey, the, the guy I'm staying with is a big fan of yours. He gets a text um, just one of the days that um, Conan's in town being like, hey, come have lunch with me. Okay. I think. <laughs> cool story, Nick. No one will know how long the start of that sentence and this sentence has been. <laughs> the <laughs> gap between what I just said and what I'm saying now is going to be seamless in the edit Vast. and going to be, you know, basically unnoticeable. But for us, it has been an eternity. It's been. It's been months. So Conan O'Brien came to Christchurch and he uh, texted my friend and they went to lunch because he heard that he was a big fan. So uh, that seems to me like a genuinely nice person, kind of cool guy thing to do. Um, Mm. But now here's where things get a little juicy. Oh, boy. And this is where I have had to decide whether our massive listenership was going to really affect the 
ability to tell this story. Because what this guy then did was ask Conan to propose to his girlfriend for him. And they recorded a video and uh, it was basically Conan being funny and interesting and yeah. being like, this guy wants to get married to you. If you said yes, great decision. Wow, he seems great. And if you say no, great decision. Good choice. This guy's a dipshit. And it's just him standing next to Conan as Conan recorded this message. So uh, now that you have this information, Michael, opinions A on Conan as a personality and B on would you get a celebrity to do the proposal for you? Conan, yes, it depends. Does the does the lady, the lady, the woman like Conan? I don't know that answer. That's crucial because if I did that for Lauren, she'd be like, "Who the fuck is this?" <laughs> she doesn't know Conan ever, right? I don't think so. Gosh, are you sure you want to be with this woman? Mm. I mean, he wrote some of the best episodes of The Simpsons. I told her that <laughs> she was unaffected. I hope this. I mean, not for your friend, but just for comedy that she said no <laughs> it is kind of nice that he couched it both ways yeah <laughs> i wonder how many times he's been asked to like pop the question to people do you reckon that's a normal like do you reckon brad pitt's walking down the street and gets that every day no brad pitt doesn't talk good <laughs> and you i heard it i heard it yeah. i heard it okay <laughs> Uh, so was that the end of the story? Yeah, it was. Well, that was oh. that was that was phase one. That was Conan. Okay, I, I said that there are three big international names. Going. I know this was like forty-five minutes ago since we started the <laughs> sentence. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a saga on top of a saga. It's a saga. This is I means so much effort to get to just a fairly, you know, generic podcast start. Yeah, I mean, what a fizzer. <sighs> His uh, international person number two, Tom York, in Christchurch this week. I've heard of him. Yeah. He's coming to town. He's playing the Everything Tour, which is just him by himself playing everything from every group and band he's ever been part of. Mm -hmm. This is the start of the tour. The very first show he's ever done like this is in Christchurch. So wow. I don't know at all what that even means. Like, is it just him in front of a piano? Is he going to be like a DJ set? I've got no expectations. Yeah. But now, so... um. Just to, I don't want you to tell me anything uh -huh. just ahead of time. Yep. I got, I got sent a set list, like a Spotify set list thing that, well, that doesn't actually make sense. It can't, because, it can't, yeah, it can't be reflective of anything because. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Cause I got annoyed, but then I was like, this body snatches was on there. I was like, how are you going to do that on a piano? Yeah. I really, I'm very, very curious. Like, is he going to play fucking Suspiria? And, you know, like, is a muck going to be in there? Is he going to be throwing a little creep on piano at the end? Like, I have no, I, I'm very curious to know what it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, the, um, what are the, what are the, the sessions that he did with, um, with the glasses? You know, he's going through his glasses face, uh, the big glasses and the long hair. With the piano. You mean like from oh, the basement? something lady, lady sessions, yeah. Oh, the one that was like a, just a couple of tracks on like BBC yeah. Radio or something? Yeah, no, he did, he did Bloom, which is yeah, just the which best. Yeah, which is a great performance. The best. Yeah, so maybe it's like a whole bunch of like loop pedals and layers yeah, and would, shit. I would say so, yeah. Yeah, I'm very, very excited. Um, accompanying him to Christchurch is dad who's coming over for this so oh, he's supporting uh, he, yeah. he's opening he's doing more of a poetry thing i think it's just reading from his novel um, slam but uh cannot wait i i've taken your note i won't send any word about it when is the show for you in milks uh the wednesday the yeah the following this week, wednesday a week later yeah. So, so oh, the next wednesday. time we record we will have been post post york and we can record yeah a very boring a very podcast for everyone, life. but very fun for us. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, ooh, but I'm yeah, we should excited. do a massive debrief. Yeah. Massive. Everything. Yeah. Four hour pod. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty And cool. the election. The election will probably have happened. Will it? It's the, the sixth. Third? 
six. Oh, no, it'd be the week after. Yeah. Well, that's okay. We don't want to burn all of our good material at once. True. We can be really slow two weeks later to talking about the election news. That could be funny. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, there's probably going to be stuff that happens in the aftermath. So we might be perfectly timed for a next capital riot. Nice. That'd be nice. Yeah. Um, and then finally, third big international name coming to Christchurch. Rumour has it Michael and Lauren are coming to New Zealand this year. Have you heard anything Whoa, about this? Massively jumping the gun here. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, no, we we really do want. To, we really do want to. Um, yeah, it's just time. I'm con- so. You said you've got. Uh, obviously, I want to see you um, and Casper, who lives in Auckland. Um, so t- it'd be not, I haven't been to New Zealand before, so I want to make a, like a road trippy kind of thing out yeah. of it and see all of it. And it's probably, you know, having two friends on the Both top ends, and tail yeah. is handy. Um, but I don't want like, so you said you've got like two people staying with you in November and we were thinking about late November and I was like, I can't do this to you. I can't yes, do November. Can. It's good. It's too much. It's no, too it's much not. They're here for like two nights. I'm thinking about Casey as well. Like, well, he, Casey he doesn't must... like you anyway. So what's different? Does he really not like me? <laughs> no, that's just me stirring up your insecurities. Oh boy, God, that's a great idea, Nick. Yeah, because because <laughs> yes. they're cause... really going to sell you to come to New Zealand. I see. What, yeah, I see the the hole I've put myself in now. Yeah, and I definitely won't try and overcompensate. Yeah, for Make that sure little for nugget hug, that you yeah. put. Oh boy. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, I can't do that. I don't know. Yes, you Maybe can. January. It's Maybe January. Fine. Well, yeah, if you want. Maybe January. We might just get married there, honestly. Okay, fair enough. Just do it all at once. I think we won't. Yeah. Don't, tell, don't tell the fan. <laughs> the, the, true, the true ticket to attending the Michael Lauren wedding is listening to the podcast. Because then if you know, you'll, you'll tag along. And if you don't, the, well, you should have been a bigger fan. Yeah, that's actually not bad. I'll just send it. RSVP via yeah. the pod. Here's the URL. <laughs> yeah. Hoping to get our number, get our get some engagement that way. Yeah, finally. Oh, engagement. Yeah. Oh, we'll extend two levels. Anyway, but yeah, maybe I, we will. We will. Promise. Promise. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, the, uh, the longest introduction, you know, waffle segment of the podcast ever recorded is now complete. The now, floor the is yours. Is, well, we don't know how to how long we've been going. I, guess <laughs> I feel like it's probably it only like ten minutes, but I don't know. Okay. Um. So, uh, well, well, what's going on with me? Thanks for asking. Um, I think I did ask. I've been, I've just been just been trying to be a bit more grateful and appreciative of of um of things lately. Okay. Has that been prompted by anything? Well, I just, you know, we've got segments here. We've got myths and, you know, it's just it's so much negativity. So I'm just like <laughs> trying to, I'm trying to like just be grateful for, you know, moments that you don't necessarily clock. Sure. Um, and um, one of those moments today was, you know, we've got the, the door open to let the dog in and out so she doesn't piss in the house, even though she does still. Um, and that, that, that lets flies in, you know, so sometimes... Sometimes we're coming to the house and the big buzzy fly, big buzzy fly. That's classic yeah. myth material. Don't you hate a big bu- buzzy fly? Yeah. Now, ordinarily, that would be a myth, a strong myth. Um, but you know what? I, you know, try to try to get this. Uh, I'm like, oh fuck, the flies in the house again. Just disgusting. Do you think it's the same you know? one? I think it is. Yeah. Um, same same wings. Same wings. Um, <laughs> and so. I'm like, go to open the window to let this fly out. Just goes straight out of its own volition, of its own volition, just left. Uh huh. As soon as I open the window, uh-huh. and I was like, that is, I should appreciate this moment right now because when does that ha- ever happen? <laughs> this is like Michael's moment is in. Like this is oh. you, this is you really sort of reaching out and appreciating the universe and our place in it. You know, genuinely writing that down. Great segment, Michael's moment of zen. Bear with me. A E L. <laughs> You're like E A L. Fuck. What about Zuba Zen? Like something Z Z Z. Do people call Zuba? It. Yeah, we can we can workshop this off. For Michael's it. moment of Zen. Genuinely I love right. I love every single um, key tap just reverberating the microphone. It really makes us feel at home, like we're there in the room with you. More to come. 
Um, now, the thing that that wasn't what I wanted to speak to you about, Nick, obviously. Okay. Um, what do you mean, obviously? So, I thought this fly diversion was a, uh, an important part of the pod, and I respect you bringing it up. Well, it wasn't the conversation topic that I told you about earlier this week. Yeah. So this is it. Don't know if it's got legs. All right. But I've been thinking about pr- pr- the idea, the concept of pretentiousness. Okay. Right? Now, do you, do you think... What what is pretentiousness? I'm like trying to define it, which I know, I know that, that this pe- there's probably some people going, you know, you fucking take a look in the mirror, mate. But I I don't know what the line is. I don't know how to define it, and I'm trying to like define it in other people that I I've felt that about before. Okay. But then when I've tried to deconstruct it in my head, I feel like there's nothing there. Like it's not it's not real. Well, I suppose, you know, and the linguists might call me out on this, but my first inclination of where that word comes from is the idea of a pretense, right? Like a something that is put on. So right. it seems logical to me that there isn't anything there, right? Like that seems consistent with whatever that original statement or original word was, right? It's an, an affectation, right? So right. the fact that if you start to pull it apart, it doesn't make sense. Well, maybe that's that's consistent, you know, with, with what it is. But have you looked it up? Like, what is the actual definition? All right. So pretentious means attempting to impress by affecting greater importance or merit than is actually possessed. So that's, that's right. So that's what you're saying. Okay. So I guess the thing is, though, it's subjective. And maybe I'm thinking about it as if it's like this uh, rock solid ideal or concept that you know can be easily you know or measured um but i guess it is subject subjective because well maybe it's not can you can you just recap that phrase again for me again one more time so i can get it into the, the definition i mean in my head pretentious attempting attempting to impress by affecting greater importance or merit than is actually possessed right so it's you know, if you see a film, but okay, this is the thing. I'm I'm, I'm at risk of going down lots of tangents on this. And That's not okay. That's what podcasts are for. Finishing all of them. Um, so it's kind of, to me, it seems tied to am, like a, an ambitious, like if you're talking about art, ambitious, uh, an ambitious, like a big swing and maybe not sticking the landing. You know, if you think about an art, uh, an, uh, you know, a film, um, that, that tries to, I don't know, noir or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, but like tries to go for something, you know, I think big I'd, or... I think I'd push back on that slightly because to Please. me, I don't think it is a big... Sw- I don't think it's the idea of taking the swing, right? It's not the, I- it's not the idea of doing something explicitly ambitious or unprecedented or taboo or provocative. I think it is the assumption that that brings more merit or worth to it than the end product actually has it. It's more important. So I oh, think and you, th- that would the assumption there would be of the artist. Yes, the artist assumption. The art. Yeah, the, the assu- yeah, then, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, the person you, who is being pretentious. Yeah, but then you're just assuming as the viewer of that art you are you are assuming that you are that that's what they're doing that's true you're s- trying to you're, you're, you're like, presupposing the goals of the, the intention yeah. yeah but i think that's that's true in the context of pretentious art right but i think there are also ways that pretentiousness is embodied outside of creativity. Like a pretentious person might Mm -hmm. be someone who, uh, you know, goes to work wearing the full formal regalia and, you know, like a a fancy suit jacket and this kind of thing, even when the the dress code doesn't call for it and, and in doing so acts with a degree of superiority or something, right, that's uncalled for. Like, but that's even in pretentious. That, is it, though? Because even in that scenario, 
that could just be a choice, like a genuine choice. I can imagine someone who just like really likes suits and that's how I want to dress. Like to like a pretend that like a, the definition of pretentiousness or the epitome of pretentious is like to me, you know, taking a book out and wanting to be seen reading a book out and maybe not even reading the book. And just, so like reading the art of war in a park or, you know, like war and peace or something like that. Right. It's, yeah. 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 Uh, but to be seen doing that. Well, I think a hundred percent, like if that's what they're doing it for, then that's pretentious. Cause it's about wanting to seem important or different, right. Or better or superior. Yeah. But intellectual. Yeah. To your point, what if you just really want to read War and Peace and you're going for a walk? You know, like this is it. Pretentiousness only is is just an, an a ju- is a judgment. Yeah. So interestingly, here one of the examples that I looked up on in the the definition here, like the sample sentence is their song titles are pretentious in the context of their basic lyrics, which does mm-hmm. sound like every song I've ever named. <laughs> <laughs> just like, you know, you put the uh, the meaning of life in or some sort of like Latin lyrics or you name like a band Sif Mons or something like that because it has this kind I knew of that was flavor coming. I knew that was of coming. like scientific. So mean. <laughs> okay, but, but okay. Well, this is kind of why I was thinking about this. Yeah. It's, it is kind of why because, I, you know, I do fight, I do f- even in that example, uh, I don't even know if it's worth spelling it's it out. It's not worth it. <laughs> trying to like come up with a moniker that, that like I genuinely like or, or bands that I would, I like the name of and they kind of have a s- similar element going on. Like, but I am worried, uh, you know, even doing, you know, this vague mu- music project, I am worried that I will be perceived as pretentious. But even in my head, I'm like, am I? Because I feel like it's, I can justify it to myself. Yeah. No, I think that's valid then, right? Like, I think what you've identified here is a true reality of of society, which is that pretentiousness requires both an, uh, an actor and a viewer, you know, like someone who does it and someone who perceives it. And that's a two-person um, interaction. But each yeah. of those are happening independently, and it may well yes. be that someone has thought through and really considered and landed on a, you know, a title or a behavior or a dress or a piece of art or whatever it is that has deep and well established meanings. And it may well be that that is put in front of a second person who has no idea of any of that and looks and goes, ah, fucking, you know, wanky art. Bullshit. Exactly. I do. I, I. I do kind of think it's like a bit of a lazy, uh, a lazy kind of judgment to apply to something. And I've done it before. Like I think about like what things I've thought were pretentious in my life. <clears throat> the examples that I could think of were, uh, you know, like at, at an art gallery, like a modern art kind of exhibition. Yeah. That maybe it's like super minimalist, or like there's you know maybe it's a blank canvas or something. And I'm like, oh, that's, but. I just didn't get it. You know, I, that's, that's, that, that was the, uh, that was the issue there. It wasn't the artist, artist's fault at all. Uh, it could have been, maybe it was, but it was lazy of me to, to just throw that away. I, I agree. I think it is interesting to go through the evolution of assuming that all art should mean something to all people when it doesn't and f- cannot. Yeah. So it may well be that uh, when you looked at a thing and you didn't get it, it wasn't that it was at some like higher level of um, pretentiousness or, you know, it was trying to be snooty or superior. It may well have been, but yeah. it could also just be that this person is making things in a way that doesn't resonate with you. And that's exactly. fine. You know, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, I remember seeing Bo, like Bo is Afraid, you know, the Ari Aster movie with Joaquin. Yeah, that. I didn't see it, but I know Jeez. Logan. Yeah, Joaquin Phoenix. It's like a three-hour movie. It's it's like very ambitious in style, whatever. And I was like, oh, I, nah. I, and I remember thinking that was pretentious. But then I watched like a um, an analysis video on it where it kind of explains all the thing. And I was like, this is a masterpiece. Yeah, I just completely 180 on that. Interesting the way that 
another voice and another perspective on it can then change the way you see the things. Because that is, again, speaking to the idea that pretentiousness is in the eye of the beholder, right? Yeah. I, I do, as someone who really likes modern art, like if I had a... Sh- <laughs> exactly. Because it makes me feel better than other people. Um, but if I was to pick a gallery, I but would... But you are better than other people, Nick. Oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Um, if I was to pick a gallery, like if I was going to New York or, you know, some big city where I had a dozen places I could head, I would almost always favour going to modern art galleries over, like, classical galleries. Um, yeah. And there are certain, you know, historical art you know, artists and that kind of thing that I have time for. But anytime I end up in a place and it's, you know, wall to ceiling with, uh, you know, a hundred mostly identical sitted portraits of like 1700s noblemen, I just like, I ca- I cannot care. I-, I find it impossible to like connect with that or even just like generic, like, landscapes and these kind of I just it doesn't do it for me but you yeah. put me in front of like a fully black canvas which has slightly different like textured black mm. ripples by the paintbrush and there's like maybe one dot of red in it I would stare at it and be like this is fucking incredible and that meanwhile like everyone next to me you know is having a different reaction and some people are like it's just fucking black I don't get it <laughs> yeah yeah you yeah. know so I think we're just talking about the subjectively subjectivity of art at that point right because well, do you think do you think there's anything that is objectively pretentious? Um, well, I think there has to be some degree of overlap with wealth, right? Like at a certain point, if you are wearing your, I don't know, thirty-two carat gold pendant with the emerald in it and you know you're taking it out to dinner at fucking Pizza Hut or whatever, like at a certain point wearing your wealth so openly is pretentious, right? Like, is it though? Yeah. Because it's it, it, unnecessary it, and you have options not to and you choose to wear things that draw attention to yourself and make yourself seem more That's interesting. Because I feel like in that scenario, like I'm just thinking about, like I don't know, the the, the rich rich guy with the Lamborghini or whatever. Yeah, like it kind of goes beyond pretentious, and it goes to something worse, which is even which is pity. <laughs> As in, from you, the viewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, oh, you sad little man. Yeah, yeah. But you have to. That is again, we're talking about two way streets here. That is your perception of it but from yeah. their perception from his perception he you could i think argue is being pretentious because he's chosen to wear that you know drive that lamborghini down to i don't know to be seen to be but seen it, yeah to be seen and to but it doesn't well attempting i'm, I'm just looking at the definition uh, attempting to impress by affecting greater importance or merit than is actually possessed but he does have the Lamborghini. But is that more important? Does that make him more important as a person at the Pizza Hut than anyone else? You know, scooping your jelly out of the tub. No, he's just he's just mm. anyone else on a wonderful lunchtime deal, getting as much pizza and pasta as he can eat. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's a real, uh, real uh, headphone cord tangling in the brain. This concept. Mm. Good analogy, Michael. Well said. I don't even need to reply anymore. You can just be your own reinforcement. Oh, this is an interesting one, actually. Signs of pretentious people, BuzzFeed. Uh, one of <laughs> so someone someone's put written in examples here. Uh, my cousin, for example, rolls every R on a Spanish word like burrito. Burrito. That's interesting. That like over pronouncing like foreign Barcelona, words. Barcelona, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, f. I hate it when people say f. Just say f. No, come on. I will They're always de- say f. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I just googled looking for the same things you were doing. Here's an article in Psychology Today: How people become pretentious. Some people appear inauthentic. They perform rather than just talking as though there's always a mirror in front of them and they're seeing their interlocutor. 
Oh, and instead of seeing their interlock, that's such a pretentious word to throw into the first paragraph of a thing about pretentiousness. Interlocutor. Interlocutor. Uh, there's something puzzling about pretentiousness. On the one hand, it's pretentious are obviously concerned, perhaps too much so, with the way they'll be perceived. On the other hand, we all profess to prefer simplicity and authenticity. But if that's right, then the pretentious are doing the opposite of what they should be doing if they wish to be viewed favorably. So why do they mm. behave as they do? Mm. It's it's the it's the opposite of authentic. Yeah, I guess. The first thing to note is that almost all human communication has a performative aspect. Sometime mm. in childhood, we realize that what we say and do has an effect on the way others see us, and we begin to care about it. We develop a social self, a likeness of us that exists in the eyes of others. We're understandably concerned about our social selves. We don't like to make a bad impression and take pains to avoid embarrassment. This is to be expected and within limits, it is probably a good thing. Indeed, if someone never gave a damn about what the rest of us thought, we wouldn't like that either. Another point to note is that the perception of pretentiousness in others may be based on a misunderstanding on our part. Ron yeah. may think, for instance, that Mariella's love of high-end coffee is pretentious because he cannot tell the difference between two coffee brands. And he concludes yeah. that there's no difference in anyone who claims otherwise as a snob, feigning a refined mm. taste. But Ron could be mistaken. The brands that she prefers may be exquisite, though it may take a coffee aficionado to appreciate this. Mm. Yeah, that's So the, that's what like we were the, talking about earlier, the subjectivity of it and the... But that's a good example, like the the uh, the 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 wine, the snob, wine or the, sommelier, you know, when yeah. when they get into wine in their you know retirement years. And yeah, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, it's a whole. I mean, it's a never ending thread. Do, can do you can you identify any times in your life that you have been pretentious? Like you you'd have space from it or distance from it now, where you you were like I was pretentious then. Um. Not in terms of like an explicit um, moment. I think you're with, when you were with wearing that people. beret all the time. When I, the beret, was, I thought, was though subjectively is. cool. So I think yeah. maybe that speaks more about your perspectives of berets that of like how they are, you know, just generally. Right. Okay. Um, I think there's a, probably a couple of things. One is like. Um, uh, like as someone who went to private school and was surrounded by a bunch of people in private school contexts and not public school contexts, I think I definitely, when I like entered the workforce and met people from wider backgrounds, had to unlearn like assumptions I had about society and about money and about, you know, those sort of things in experiencing the way other people, you know, lived and, and that kind of thing. So I don't have like a concrete example of that, but I think consciously I tried to unpretentious a little bit maybe. Yeah. Because you realize that, you know, it's like the not Harvard everyone had the privileges with, you had. You, you know. want to downplay rather than, yeah. 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 I, I, it's not like I was ever ashamed of, of that, but at the same time, I think what, what you're touching on there is, is true. There's, it's it's unnecessarily boastful sometimes to to get into yeah. the privileges you had yeah and part of being pretentious is accepting that you're not act uh, sorry part of being an adult is accepting that you're not any better than anyone else around you right and that that you have to kind of grow up and learn that that the world is full of people with different perspectives, different backgrounds and different opportunities than you had. Right. Yeah. 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 I feel you. Um, this article here talks about different kinds of pretentiousness uh, and includes the boastful pompous kind characterized by name dropping and mm. ostentatious displays of the trappings of success. Sometimes of successes that one pretends to have, but doesn't. Yes. Um, so that's, that's the worst one. That's, the, the I, like a name drop is I think the most grating like interpersonal experience I think you can like one of the worst ways to rub someone the wrong way it's also just like so 
not self-aware because now there's like a name for it now. Everyone knows name drop is a thing, yeah. you know? And so if you're not apologizing in the run-up to a name drop, yeah. then you're not a person. Yeah. Here's, here's the other one, though. Here's the more subtle variety of pretentiousness. While boastful poseurs need an audience, subdued poseurs may be quietly formal or show patronizing friendliness towards others. That's, oh. I think, a, a, um, a, a definite kind of pretentious that I'm familiar with. Like the, the, the fake friendship or the sweet or the like, the, um, you know, like the donor who's like helping in a charity cause or whatever and is, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. trying to, you know, be seen to be helping, but it's more yeah. about being seen than helping. Yeah. Like Bradley yeah. Cooper. Classic Brad Coops. It's why are we why are we angry? Energy. Him? What did he do? Definitely. Oh, he's always helping the homeless and feeding them and uh, oh, and he's uh, always speaking French on like interviews when he's overseas. I genuinely hate Bradley Cooper. <laughs> Really? I really? Yeah, I've heard him on a few podcasts and I'm like, you, he does that. He does the like, he goes so over the top to avoid compliment. I don't know. It's just, it's, he's so gross and he's so like gushing about everyone he talks to, to their face. And it's just disgusting. His most recent film, I think, was seen a little bit that way, right? Like it didn't. Maestro, exactly. It didn't um, rub people the right way, I think. Yeah, because because he's because he want because everyone can smell his desperation for an Oscar. Do you think that's that that's what motivates him most? Like that's all that he's working to. Absolutely, and he does nothing else. It's just to win an Oscar. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's pretentiousness, right? Because what ultimately is an Oscar, but some like gaudy kind of award you can out over their others right like yeah if the motivation is to win an award that's pretentious right because that's gone beyond then the intrinsic merit of the thing you're trying to of make the art yeah yeah well bradley cooper you've been put on notice <laughs> by, yeah. by the deep fort incorporated in michael's moment is in <laughs> <laughs> we're still in that subject right yeah uh well that that was interesting did you have more yeah, cool. on that you wanted to touch on? Well, I guess just just to treat this like a therapy um, session, um, I, looking back at moments that I suspect that I might... And by the way, we're the best... Per, like, you are the best person to judge whether you were, were pretentious or not. Um, you probably aren't uh -huh. thinking it at the time, but maybe a younger version of yourself. And um, I think... I could make a good case for some of the, you know, if I go back through the Brokers um, songs, there are moments th in that album that I know, Resettler on iTunes and the yeah, other Spotify. Spotify. Um, there are moments definitely in there that I'm like, we're either with a lyric, it's probably with lyrics that I'm like, that's, you don't, there's nothing behind that. I know there's nothing behind that's hollow and I'm trying to, uh, you kind of almost hide under the 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 guise of ambiguity, like it's so ambiguous that I'm yeah. just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall <laughs> and hoping that someone goes, "Whoa, yeah, that's I mean, pretentious." That's, that is, I, I will tell you that rings true. Well, you're going to say a, a lyric. Was, so when you said, <laughs> you just had one ready to go. Yeah, <laughs> I've been waiting to say this for twelve years. Um, yeah, that, that is interesting. So, um, to take this in a slightly different tangent, the video game work that I do, uh, is kind of unique because unlike many other art forms, it persists, new people play it all the time. And on Twitch, you can watch people playing that video game. So I'll mm -hmm. watch people play the game that I contributed to and see how people react to like story beats or to certain lines mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And one of the, it's a, you know, a very vain pleasure, but it's also kind of nice because it's an audience enjoying your work and they don't know that I'm there. They're just giving unfiltered it's responses. It's like a voyeur yeah. of your insecurities. It's fucking rear window. Yeah, um, it's great. But there is, 
and uh like that game and those that franchise has fans they have legitimate fans and big time fans and there are like long essays written about like the the deep thematic resonance of story beats the uh allusions to you know greek gods and the you know the philosophical um, references there that have been embodied and that th- this moment here is a reflection of the anima of this character and you know like blah, blah all of this kind of stuff and it's like simultaneously this kind of flattering thing of like yes i have all of this depth and i was pulling on all of these fantastic <laughs> linguistic sources <laughs> and you know i am a genius and i have yeah. thought every single word through and you're right it does cohere into yeah, this perfect yeah. genius whole yes. and then the truth is that a lot of the time you're just you know working one sentence to the next just sort of plugging whatever comes to mind into the gap to yeah. to make the final product yeah and the art is perceived by the you know once you put it out into the world it becomes theirs yeah. it's not yours to control how it means or how how what it means or how it's read um, yeah so you have to sit back and be like yes it was of course about the you know Kant, the classic philosophical, you know, arguments of of you know the the literary greats from hundreds of years ago, and I deliberately did all that, and yeah. thus am and deserving of your adulation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> deserving of your adulation. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's the beauty and the fun of art as well, and I'm sure like this. You know, radio, like uh, everything in its right place, wasn't that just phrases that Tom York just pulled out of a hat? And it's just like you're just projecting onto, you know, whatever, projecting whatever you meaning you want. Yeah. And I'm sure there's, you know, a lot of Radiohead songs or, you know, Boards of Canada is another like a lot of mythology around them that I'm sure there's just, this, if you ask them, they'd be like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like, absolutely nothing. Do you remember when In Rainbows came out and 15 Steps, everyone was yeah. talk, like pulling about these lyrics and like getting all these huge like literary illusions and like trying to read out like 15 Steps, like 15. <laughs> yeah. 15 so it's in five, four. So there's three lots of five. That's the 15, you know, yeah. like all these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I 100% guarantee Tom just pulled words out of my hat. Just a hundred percent, just, just yep. little fragments of of sentences from his yeah many many notebooks <laughs> just fit together yeah. rhythmically and whatever <laughs> it means afterwards is whatever it means. I know, and they had the um. Oh, I remember there was like in like they sing in rainbows in Reckoner at exactly the middle point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet they were like, I don't know if it's the fucking middle point. Yeah, we didn't measure knows? it. Yeah, we didn't even know the song order. I was like, how could it be? But then there uh, are then but- there are ones where I'm like, okay, you did rename a song on a moon shaped pool specifically so that all of the tracks are in alphabetical order. Like at that point. Oh, I didn't know about that. <laughs> yeah. A moon shape pool is alphabetical order. Every track is, is in is alphabetical order. And I'm pretty sure you, it used re- to had- be silent spring and then they made it the numbers or something like that. And, or present tense or they, they changed one of the tracks names from when it was first known of to the final album. And it, it's so that it fits the alphabet. It's a, it's a bit of a soft Easter egg, isn't it? I know. It, <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything, does it? It's just like OCD. Yeah. I gotta say, Moonshape Paul is the la- is the album. Yeah, that you I said you fell off that. Yeah. Yeah. The first yeah. first word of that album, stay. Last word of that album, leave. There you go. Hans Zimmer. And that was deliberate. If you've enjoyed this podcast, well, that's so flattering and. Get ready for next time because it'll be more Radiohead deep dives as we really get into the weeds of what it all means. But if that doesn't sound like you think, then you should just listen to one of the other episodes we have. There's 240 odd of them now in the back of the feed. So pick another one and and have some good time back in the old uh, archives there. Then you can get in touch with us by contacting us on Instagram, on Facebook. You can send an email to deepford at gmail.com. You can rate us on Spotify. You can rate us on iTunes, which is called Apple Music these days, if you go looking. Um, so just FYI. And you can try to be less pretentious in your day-to-day life, though does it really matter? Who knows? I think that's left up in the air. No one will know. No one will know. Except for you. No one will know. Okay. 
I just had this in my notes for a while and it was just one of those to-do list items. Michael, why is a week seven days long? Julius Caesar. Incorrect. Do you have any, have you ever wondered? uh, I mean, so much of the metrics of our uh, dates, times and all these kind of things are based on physical things like a year, you know, one trip around the sun, a uh, month, you know, is connected to the, the moon. Uh, A day is like one rotation on the axis. All these are physical properties. Mm. Then all of a sudden we get off into weird territories where we have seven days in a week, which is not seemingly connected to any (laughs) real um, uh, physiological, you know, physical reality. So have you ever wondered about Explain that more though, because it's not divisible by... Well, there's no, there's just nothing happens in the real world on a seven day frequency, right? So oh, right, right, right. a year is one physical object moving around the yeah, sun. You it's know? measured by seasons. It's seasons. Like it literally takes that much time yeah. for it to literally move in our orbit. You know, yeah. a day is literally how long it takes to rotate on the axis. You know, these are physical right. properties that have defined our world. But seven days is arbitrary. There were uh, historical societies that had eight day weeks. Some of them had uh, five day weeks or 10 day weeks, I should say like these were, um, arbitrary choices. And I wondered if you'd ever considered why it is we're in this rhythm of five days on and then a two day weekend where this came from. I I have, I've considered, well, just because I think the working week should be four days of work, three days off. Yeah. But that's that just still feels seven. correct. I agree, but that's still okay, seven. Yeah. Well, why is October the 10th month? <laughs> that's a different question that i'm not prepared to answer so you have to <laughs> google that on your own time julius caesar um so here here's uh an article i read uh about exploring some of this a little bit um okay so the week and the month are a bit trickier than the the other dates that we set up because there's no physical correlation right the phases of the moon don't exactly coincide with the solar calendar. So a moon cycle Mm -hmm. is 27 days and seven hours, and there are 13 phases of the moon in a solar year. So it's it's still a bit fuzzy. Right. But the answer to the question of where did seven days come from is largely cause of, drumroll please, the Babylonians. The Babylonians who lived in modern day Iraq. So they were big, like, astronomer types they were observing the heavens this was sort of astronomer types the reason they picked the number seven was that they observed seven celestial bodies the sun the moon mercury venus mars jupiter and saturn and so that number was just particularly significant to them and that's what they chose to to build it around so egyptians had a 10-day work week the romans had an eight-day week huh so the Babylonians split the lunar months into seven-day weeks, which gave them a 28-day month. Um, but were they working off the calendar that we have now? Uh, I don't think so. I think that came about later. So here's how it then propagated. So the Babylonians were a dominant culture in the Near East in the 6th and 7th centuries BC. And then this rhythm of the seven day weeks and many of your other notions of time, like a 60 minute hour persisted. Mm. So it spread through the near East. It was adopted by the Jews who'd been captured captives of the Babylonians at the height of that civilization's power. Then other cultures around them got on board, including the Persian empire and the Greeks. Then centuries later, Alexander the great began to spread Greek culture through the near East as far as India and the seven day week spread to India. And then scholars think that maybe India then introduced that to China. And then finally, once the Romans began to conquer the territory that Alexander the Great had influenced, they too then shifted from an eight to a seven day um, week and made Sunday a public holiday in 321 AD. So, how. This is genuinely fascinating, by the way. How long after this. the introduction of the seven day week do you think the weekend? was introduced so the week what is the weekend it's um it's just like to separate work from leisure right correct why do we need a weekend oh well why do we need to label it it's just for work well it's 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 a yeah it's a labor versus leisure time i think as you say right yeah so do you have any guess of when it was introduced 
you, you've sort of you've stumbled into the right area to work it out. What was the question again? When did the weekend become introduced? Well, it does say in the Bible that God created the earth in seven days. Yeah. So, what was zero BC? Zero BC before the introduction of <laughs> the seven day week. I forgot that zero <laughs> BC is actually still very much a year that, <laughs> yeah. that has history. And 321 was when they introduced the week. So <laughs> 320 years Earth. before the introduction of the seven day week, they got the idea of the weekend sorted. That's my guess. <laughs> yes. Lock it in. Okay. okay. Lock it in, Eddie. Um, no, it was the 20th century, 20th what? century. So literally nearly two millennia. Well, that makes sense. One and a half it? millennia. Yeah. Before that, Actually, Wait, which is because oh, it on. came along with the uh, commensurate like industrial revolutions and you know those. Um, which one's the twentieth century? I don't. The nineteen. Th- that that confuses me. Yeah, yeah. Nineteen hundred. I never never get it. Yeah. What are we in now? Twenty first. Yes. Doesn't make sense. When? <laughs> Why is it not? So the first century starts at zero, year zero, and ends at one hundred. Whenever, whenever I read it or uh, hear it, I always have to think about it. And it just annoys me that it's not easy to... I mean, it probably is. So this is, this is a classic bit of pub trivia. Who invented The weekend? Um, Julius Caesar? <laughs> we just <laughs> talked <time>. about it. <laughs> we just talked like, about it being in the 1900s. Oh, yeah, yeah. 20th century. Um um, I don't know, Gandhi. No, nah, it was Henry Ford. The, the car guy. The car guy who invented the 40-hour work week. Five eight-hour days oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. two days off this. on the weekend. 1914. We're only 110 years past the invention of the weekend. It feels like it's been around forever, but it's not. It was a, it was a labor and industrial revolution invention. Someone had to invent the idea of you don't have to work every single day of your life. He fucked it up. Also, if we're this early in to the concept of a weekend, we could probably change it. I think you know, yeah, there's probably pretty easily probably reasonable. Um, so here's here's a second article here talking about the that idea of the malleability of the seven day week. Um, so this is an interview in uh, the Atlantic with a guy who wrote a book, um, David Henkin. His book, "The Week: A History of the Unnatural Rhythms That Made Us Who We Are." which traces the evolution and analyzes the curious staying power of what he lovingly refers to as a recalcitrant calendar unit. Um, It has stuck around for millennia, but he asks like what changed in the 19th century about how the week was seen societally. And David Henkin says, the week became far more important to people's ordinary lives beyond the question of whether it was Sunday, the day of rest or not. It became what it is in some ways, the most stabilizing calendar unit that we have. Uh, when you think it's a Tuesday and it turns out to be Wednesday, you feel disoriented mm. in a way that you don't typically, if you think it's the 26th, then it turns out to be the 27th. Yeah. Like that's a, a, a different grip on the consciousness. And he says that if you were to single out one factor about why this happened, it would be urbanization. It's a social phenomenon. It's about people wanting to be able to make schedules with others, especially strangers, either in a Mm. consumer context or socially. When most people lived on farms or in small villages, they didn't need to coordinate many activities with folks they didn't see regularly. Mm. So once uh, cities and things started to crop up, it became much more important to know what day of the week it is. And then that they start to get very philosophical here. They ask like, how did this change make time feel different? And so hmm. Henkin here says it's hard to prove as a historian, but I think when we're more attuned to this cycle, because it's shorter than a month, it feels like time moves more quickly. When our Mondays are different from our Tuesdays and our Wednesdays, it does kind of feel like all of a sudden, oh, it's it's Monday again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see in 19th century diary entries that more and more often people describe this feeling by referring to how another week has come and gone. Yeah, that is interesting because you do, if you think, you know, um, it doesn't feel like a Monday or it, for me, it's like, a, it doesn't feel like a Friday. It's it's the beat of the city. It's the beat of like what's going on outside, how people are moving, how, how many people, subconscious stuff, how many are people in pubs, yeah. you know, like kind of that stuff. Yeah. And it, it like it's a glue, right? It's like a social glue. Like you, you feel like 
we're all on this ride almost together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's like, oh, if we could just get to Friday, you know, like it's got this yes. cohesiveness to it. Yes. Um, and just to touch on what you were talking about earlier, he describes efforts up made 100 to 150 years ago to reform the yearly calendar and make weeks more orderly. Um, so the question is like, what problems were they trying to like target with this effort? Um, and the goal was to quote, tame the week and have it make more sense. The week is a bizarre unit of time. It's the only one that doesn't fit neatly into the fraction of any larger unit, like everything yeah. else does from seconds to centuries. Um, there's another issue that for businesses, it causes bookkeeping irregularities because you have a different number of weeks in a month or a quarter or a year. It's so a they would, a mess, isn't it? It's such a mess. When you start to think about it, and, oh, get well, it together. there's this as well. When, when they were trying to sell these reforms as solving a broader problem, which was that you would say like today's Tuesday, November 16, 2021, which is technically redundant because there's no November 16, 2021 that isn't also Tuesday. <laughs> but when people mix up weekdays and dates, like they schedule something for Wednesday, November 16, which might not exist in a given year, causes all these kind of confusions. And, you know, how many times have you gone back and it's been like, do you mean Tuesday the 16th or do you mean Wednesday the 17th? Like which one of them's the typo? Yeah. All that kind of headaches. So what changes did they want? Well, the solution was to change the calendar so that November 16 is always Tuesday. So the most popular calendar reform proposal was for the year to consist of 364 days that always have the same weekday attached to them, and then to have a couple of, quote, blank days at the end of the year that don't count at all as part of any seven-day week. So reforms uh. like these were heavily supported by business interests in the United States and the scientific community. This was in the what, period- What year was this? Uh, this was in the 100 to 150 years ago. Okay. So this was the period when the international dateline was established and time zones were instituted. Reform movements were successful in getting governments to go along with Greenwich Mean Time, but it mm. just couldn't get over line with the week. Um, mm. And the main reason is, of course, religion, because no Christian, Muslim or Jew who's attached to the idea you can count seven day weeks all the way back to creation is mm. going to think you can just move it around. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Nerds. Nerds. Um, how, how, the, how, how do you roll this? If we were to reform it, how do you roll it out? Who decides the how long presidents? Reckon, how long like, do you reckon you have to wait? Like you'd have to be like, okay, in 2031, yeah, we yeah, are yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. on an eight day week now or whatever. Yes. Like, and everyone would have to change this like soft, like it would just be, it would be a d d disaster. Be such a head fuck. Yeah. And, and, and just you have to get everyone on board. Like. Everyone, everyone has to be on board yeah. in the world has everyone. to be on board with this. Otherwise yeah. we can't. Nigeria. Well, and and just think about like, you know, you've got planes with like computer systems that were designed in the yeah, 1990s. Yeah, it'd be like Y2K. Yeah, it's like <laughs> Actual real Y2K. bad Y2K. <laughs> it's like really bad Y2K. Yeah. So a really bad case of the Y2Ks. I'm just going to keep pushing into this a little bit further because it starts to get into a philosophical area, which I really liked. So That's what he said. <laughs> so there's a uh question about like people's attachment to the calendar for non-religious reasons despite knowing it's arbitrary once you start to get used to the idea of tuesdays or wednesdays as real things it's hard to then dispense with that rhythm right with that notion even though it's not grounded in any naturally occurring cycle it does sort of feel like a weirdly perfect amount of time to space out certain recurring yeah. activities like vacuuming or calling your family members or something like that. And so uh, the interviewer asked this question, do you think there's something about our natural rhythms that the week actually captures? The historian says, I think that's totally plausible. One hypothesis is the one you offered. The reason the week survived is because it happens to be really well matched with things. But their hesitation is about the things it's well matched with they seem so historically constructed, like how often you should talk to your mom on the phone. It wasn't the same before the telephone was invented. So there's been a neurological explanation suggested, which is that the seven day week originated or survived because humans are good at memorizing things up to seven. So oh. the seven day week could just be a good cognitive fit. But then this is the interesting one. This is the hypothesis that he's a little more drawn to because he's a historian that mm. our sense of what is an appropriate amount of time to wait between activities has been conditioned by the week. 
So we think it's yeah. an appropriate thing to vacuum every week because that's the rhythm of our lives, not because that is any more or less appropriate to vacuum or to call your family or to do anything. So it's yeah, the, I was I was thinking that the structure we're living in is actually affecting our perception of what is socially necessary. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think that's that sounds accurate. It's like we're being in. We only think it's that it should be that way because it, that's all we've ever known. Yeah. Anyway, although I just, February February still doesn't feel like a, a real month. <laughs> February, I've, I've had a lot of Februarys. Yeah, February feels like uh, it when you get through it. February feels like a trick f- for March. Like February doesn't feel like it goes any faster when you're in it, but then mm. all of a sudden you're in March. Like fuck, the year has started in a way that's really disconcerting. Yes, February is erratic. Yeah, as a, it doesn't know. She's a messy bitch, She's... and that's why we love her. <laughs> this is i don't know why that's funny feb stands in the chat yeah. good topic that was great yeah i love that a little bit of you know a little bit of uh facts every now and then yeah i was looking up um october the october debacle All the right. october um, debacle oh just just october not being the eighth month well oh, next I pod see next, we'll saying. get into that next saying. pod yeah um, this is a long outro. Yeah, fuck it. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, Nick. Fuck it. I've, I've, you know, I don't care about that stuff anymore. I'm just cool. Sometimes we just record for 80 minutes. <laughs> I have no idea how long we've been going anyway. You have, you have your impression of the week. This is yep. a segment brought 10 years in the controversial. making. Controversial. Yeah. Famously controversial. Don't worry. I've evolved. I've changed. Haven't done an impression of the week since uh, 82, I think. Um, all right. Jingle? Does it Acapella. have a jingle? Oh, does it have a impression, impression of, of the, the week? week? Yeah. Kind of hurt that you don't remember. Yeah, sorry. It, it has been a too. long time. Big gap. All right. Non-racial. Don't worry about it. All right. I'm not worried. Had the, had the legal team <laughs> yeah. look it over. <laughs> all right. So in this impression is... Christopher Walken, if he was cast as the Sudanese pirate from the 2013 uh, universally acclaimed action film, Captain Phillips. Action film? I don't know. Okay. And just to be clear, the lawyers have checked. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay. Christopher Walken, Sudanese pirate, Uh Captain Phillips. Ready? I am the captain now. (laughs) <laughs> that is good confetti. That is good And I'm, I, I think my <laughs> You can't say confetti <laughs> Do you confetti. know how long You, you gave me Did you listen to the podcast Do you I know, did I You did. gave me nothing When I When I You know Put all of that effort Into fucking confetti I and literally I, sent you a message you Saying You did not Fab edit Well I Blanked it And I needed more I needed more and well, give me more confetti. And I'll give I think you more I was praise. very clear at the end of last episode. <laughs> We're not doing confetti, just willy nilly. You give the confetti. I give the. I give the. Tell you what, I will put confetti in if you pay me five dollars. If you transfer five actual Australian dollars into my account, I'll give you ten. Put two confettis in. <laughs> Fuck yeah! Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Little side hustle here. Little side. I'm yeah. starting to like confetti. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for work, Nick? Well, I'm a writer and also a little little side hustle (laughs) putting confetti in things for five (laughs) dollars. Audio though, not the audio. Audio confetti. 